welcome back to uh, the episodes that I do. Today we have Carl Eugene Stroud back on the show, and um, we're going to be talking about all things platform, especifismo, militant, organizing, and especially uh, Carl's uh, project with the Center for Especifismo Studies, uh, Militant Kindergarten. So to kick off today's episode, why don't we just uh, find out what's been going on with you, Carl? What's new? Uh, uh, not much. We started the, the kindergarten last week, so we had one session so far. And it seems like we got a good group of people uh, participating this time. This is our second time to do it, so uh, it's pretty pretty exciting. We open it up to like uh, people from other places, too, so... A lot of people are more from our region in the Pacific Northwest in the in the U.S., but uh, there's also people from other other regions around the world too. Okay, let me put that up here real quick. Here's a little flyer for the event that um, I will uh, put up there again when you start getting into it. But this was posted to Anarchismo. I don't think it's been on Anarchist News yet, has it? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. All right. Um, yeah, so happy new year and, uh, holidays have happened and, uh, that I've been off air for a while. I'm actually kind of taking a break this year from doing as many interviews as I had just cause I have other priorities like, uh, earning a living. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You, especially if you earn your living uh, on screen also, or like looking at screens, it starts to really wear if you're trying to produce some media too. Yeah, and one thing I didn't factor in when I started doing this is that a lot of the interviews I do, I have to read a lot of shit uh, in order to be able to talk to somebody about them. And I would like to not do that again um, for a little while. Yeah, that that kind of close reading is really taxing. And that's, you know, that that is actually part of uh, where a lot of our, our ideas for militant kindergarten and the Center for Especifismo Studies really comes from, because like, uh, we're not really necessarily taught how to do those close readings that would allow you to do an interview, because yeah, it doesn't just mean like, okay, check that one off my list. It means like, read it enough and close enough to like, be able to produce some conversation around it and inquire about it. And exactly. So um, another thing that happened recently is I joined the Phoenix Anarchist Federation, who, uh, when I first found out about them, they're in the middle of listening to your audio recording of uh, one of the main texts from the Farge that we'll be talking about. So uh, this is a chance for, uh, I guess, me or us to build off of that as well. That's cool. Yeah, the those audio recordings were kind of uh, part of the production from last year's kindergarten uh, to make sure that, that all of the texts that we share are not just available in a text, but also in an audio version. There's like accessibility reasons for that, but it also relates to that kind of close reading, this idea of kind of rereading. And, you know, maybe you read it in a text and then you listen to it or maybe the other way around or uh, kind of listening to it allows you to repeat readings or get into just certain sections or something uh, more. And so, yeah, like we try to we try to really incorporate those audio recordings into into the close reading strategy. Yeah, and uh, I, they're very helpful. I didn't get through all of it, and it's still uh, on my agenda, but, uh, you know, they're very good. Um, so, not too long ago, I went on Doug Lane's show, uh, the Diet Soap podcast, and I presented um, anarchism as well as I could to his mostly Marxist uh anarchy hating audience and um uh you know i found that that this topic of a specifismo really was it felt to me like the center of gravity in the conversation and i didn't really feel 
like I had all the answers that I should. So uh, I'm happy to also have you on today to talk about this. But before we get too into all of the details of the specifismo, I kind of want to back up and get into the, the history. Um, briefly, you know, when Machno uh, came out of the experience of um, uh, Russia and the Ukraine and came up with the platform, but then especially when it gets to the Spanish CNT FAI and how that ties into it. So I know we talked a little bit about this before we hit the record button, but I wanted I wanted to back up and have you just sort of provide an intro along those lines. Yeah. So if if we're gonna think like historically, we're gonna I, I would say we need to back up a little bit further than that to Bakunin and the alliance in the international. Because what this what this is is uh, the what we could consider like the first articulation of uh, a dual uh, kind of uh, way of organizing. So what we call in in uh, anarchism organizational dualism. Okay. And the idea is that both of these uh, organizations have the same objective. But one of them is able to accomplish specific things that the other one cannot through a high degree of unity and uh, commitment to certain actions. And the other one is able to accomplish a, a wider reaching uh, mass popular level of organizing, which is necessary to actually transform all of society and not just organize a certain action. Okay. But that that same kind of mass organization is obviously not capable of being entirely unified on a lot of different levels. And so its unity needs to be characteristic of what its kind of um, mode is, which is to say popular, massive, which is different level of organizing in organizational dualism than the political level, which is all about unity. Um, okay, so I don't know if you wanna get into this now or you wanna wait to later, but one of the big questions is, can we call that a vanguard? And, or can we call the specific unified organization a vanguard? And if we can't, why not? Can we call it a party? Or what's the difference from it in a party? Just those two questions, I guess. So if we move up a little bit in history, I think that's where that maybe starts to come up is that Today, it's very common to hear a uh, uh, critique of, of this kind of organizing uh, from a, uh, an anarchist uh, who might say that this is, like you said, a vanguard or that this is a kind of uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, version of anarchism. It's a, that's a charge that's especially like uh, thrown at, at platform. Right, from like the post-left. You know, I think Lawrence Chirac had made that criticism, maybe Bob Black, but... Right. And, and so I think that, that uh, it's important to recognize that this is a characteristic of Bakunin's uh, political organizational thought that is, you know, you know from Berthier that this is not like a text that people know really well. This is not thought that's very thoroughly studied, especially not like uh, in academia. And yeah. so... So we're talking about a kind of thought that is uh, old, but also not necessarily the most common. It could totally be a lot in the same way we work today. You stumble on a pamphlet and you're like, why did no one tell me about this? And why does everyone not know about this one pamphlet? It's such a big deal. And it might be kind of the same way where people might have stumbled onto these Bakunin texts uh, almost incidentally, right? Okay. And because of that, the charge that it is something Leninist doesn't make any sense. It's a it's something articulated long before Lenin, um, and this idea that it's um, related to that is like what, what we could say like anachronistically like wrong, right? It's a it's like um, uh, sort of looking back and kind of seeing things through a different lens, and. 
also related to this is that um, you know at this part of part of this uh, articulation of the platform was uh, in contrast to a synthesis model of of organizing and that those two were it, there was there was a polemic debate amongst anarchists and it, it wasn't I think today in that you know uh, in the way we sort of reincarnate these debates the synthesists are seen in our current understanding as being anti-organizational. And that's not the case. That uh, you can see that in, in, particularly in France, where the synthesis model is even still the dominant uh, model today. And how uh, the idea of a, um, an organization that houses all of the different tendencies within anarchism seemed uh, to make a kind of sense that maybe it didn't in other places. But it is also in France where these uh, exiled uh, Ukrainian anarchists were producing these ideas about, uh, about the platform. Okay. All right. So if we go and get into the opinion part of it, just to be a little bit more concrete, you know, what we learned from Berthier's last appearance on the show was that the first international was composed, you know, of a lot of different workers federations. And then you had a general council uh, that Bakunin was sort of fighting against that Marx then manipulated uh, through basically through like gerrymandering into expelling the anarchists. Uh, meanwhile, um, so what, so how in that story does this uh, dual organization idea fit in? I'm not quite, I'm not sure what part is what there. So I think that from a, from a Marxist perspective, we could see that the uh, the objective of the international was to uh, gain power in a parliamentary uh, democracy as it stood at the time uh, in the interest of the workers. Mm -hmm. And that the, the alliance uh, related to Bakunin is... Um, not not a it sees the 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 uh, international as already being a massive organization like you said like composed of of uh, workers from different places with their own particular interests finding a federation uh, of associations on an international level and so that internationalism is what we refer to in organizational dualism in the specifismo as the social level because it is to um, its goal is to be large. Its goal is to like spread, and that that makes it so that that group like is not able to be um, maybe articulate the most revolutionary positions, right? Because it needs to remain cohesive with uh, groups from all over, which means it can't alienate groups by taking positions that are favorable in one locale and maybe not in another, or in one situation and maybe not in another. So wow. the, the uh, alliance allows the revolutionaries to articulate the most revolutionary ideas and progress those ideas. Okay. Uh, and then, so we kind of see that again with the CNT and the FAI, right? So the CNT is the syndicalist labor union, not, I don't, it, I don't know if it was like strictly anarchist or not, but the FAI definitely was. So in that, that context, we say the FAI is the, the specific organization and the CNT is the specific organization. Hold on, you're kind of cutting out there a little bit. Can you repeat that? Uh, in that context, would we say that it was the, 
the CNP was a mass organization and the FAI was the specific organization? Is that what that would look like? I think that to a certain extent that that's a, a good model of, of kind of two, two levels or two spheres of organizing, but that, uh, you know, maybe in a more dialectical sense, we can't just define like, um, uh, or, or throw a label on one group or another. And we want to really think about the social and political levels as being theoretical directions that a group can be developing into. And so one, one problem I've run into is that it's common in English, and I was absolutely uh, equally guilty of doing this, to uh, propagate a translation of like uh, uh, dualismo organizativo as uh, dual organizationalism. With, instead okay. of organizational dualism, which is the way it's, it's uh, articulated in every other language that I've found, where the ism is on this dualism, and it's not in an ontological sense, right? It's just in a, a theoretical sense, that these things are, are distinct, and that uh, they, they move in different directions. One way to, uh, to kind of conceptualize it is it like as a train track with like two rails that are right next to each other, but don't run into each other. Okay. And so these two, these two levels are complementary. And sometimes there can be a, a tendency to read a very literal kind of two orgs, you know, the popular org and the specific org. And I think that that um, we have to we have to interpret like this the Spanish Civil War as being something kind of influential to especificismo, but certainly before it. And therefore, like uh, if we can if we start to look back in the history of these things and see models of organizational dualism, those are influential to this specific articulation of organizational dualism that is a specifismo and exactly. so that's how that's how similar to platformism and the anarchists in ukraine is uh, having a level of uh, anarchist unity that is not requiring uh, uh, or expecting part of their strategy is not expecting society to become more anarchist it's making the anarchist movement more influential in the movement for liberation of society. Gotcha. And another question that immediately follows that, that also came up was <clears throat> how exactly do anarchists do that if they're not imposing their ideology onto, let's say, like uh, a Soviet with uh, party apparatchik uh, taking control of it. What is the anarchist way? So the, the idea here, and this relates exactly to this question about the FAI and the CNT, is that from the perspective of Especifismo, the syndicate, the union, is a terrain of struggle, similar, similar to the community assembly or to the... Um, uh, student organizations or um, all, all kinds of different things that could maybe be organized in society on a social level where there is a class struggle going on, but that those are terrains. And in order to make anarchism influential and anarchist ideas influential in those spaces, anarchists have to also articulate those ideas amongst themselves to the most unified programmatic degree possible, which does not mean taking those ideas to the social space and expecting people to convert to anarchism. It involves, and, and this is really important because I think the distinction between Vanguard in a kind of Leninist conception, or even in certain translations of the, the platform, a lot of these translations are specifically to not be favorable to it, but uh, they're common in the discourse because of that. Um, 
the difference between a vanguard and what we're talking about with the specifismo is that a specifismo is talking about an active minority, which means it's not trying to overcome its minority status in some way to gain influence. Okay. But in the same way that maybe maybe we talk about, uh, this is common in, in other uh, leftist currents as well, like the idea of class autonomy, that a movement needs to be like independent of, of uh, ruling class influence in order to be uh, revolutionary. It, the same idea applies in this uh, concept of organizational dualism, that the political level also needs to be independent so that it doesn't function in the same cycles as the social level. We could see that um, if we think about in Spain, I don't, I don't think that there was this same degree of um, kind of autonomous level of organizing and that we could imagine a lot of the militants from the FAI becoming more interested in militating for the CNT in particular, which starts to over time mean uh, there's not as clear of an anarchist position that's actually articulated. All right. So I guess the other side of that same question would be, how is this different than an affinity group? So then the way that that's different is, and, and this is a, a sort of theory that uh, we've are kind of developed more recently through our study is that we maybe could think of these affinity groups or in the US, uh, we've kind of thought of them more as like stations in a sense that like they're, they could be identitarian or um, kind of uh, cultural or um, they could be uh, neighborhood related or other things like that, but that we tend to kind of engage in these spaces that are um, radical to a certain degree, but not necessarily political. And the way we can understand this in, from this uh, organizational dualist perspective is that we, I think in the US, we have these kinds of things stuck in the middle and we need to confidently like move them in one direction or the other that we need to decide like is this group here to grow and to become more popular or is this group here to uh, become more unified around a specific ideology and a program and that in in kind of compartmentalizing these these uh, efforts i think that anarchists start to unburden the social level of the like a nitty gritty debate of what the program is. And they're actually able to go there in a more unified way, even if there's maybe uh, less of them that are completely attached to that program. Okay. And so it's, it's not um, the, the way that it, this is different than just an affinity group is that to a certain extent, uh, Especifismo is a kind of, call for those affinity groups, the, the people in those affinity groups with the most uh, uh, affinity to the anarchist program also organize on a political level with other people from other affinity groups. And the, again, that would work a similar way to like um, um, other, other kinds of uh, identitarian groups like uh, something that came up in our discussion just the other day is if there's a, a, a group that's organized around uh, a racial identity, that group does not have an ideological uh, uniformity to it. And it can be really problematic to try to establish one. It can be uh, especially authoritarian and patriarchal. And so um but but the, the anarchists can't just abandon these spaces that involve other ideologies. So actually, like, taking on an anarchist ideology, committing to that, militating for that, actually allows you to interact with people of other ideologies in a way that's based on practical need and, like, uh, something more uh, 
social and uh, um, not necessarily like this kind of like uh, leftist unity, but uh, uh, practical unity of people who actually like uh, share that space with you, you know, like uh, your workplace or your neighborhood is not full of people that just agree with you, but you do share like uh, certain needs with them and you're on the same side of the struggle as them whether everybody realizes it or not. Sure. Yeah. Which for me, I mean, it directly relates to my experience uh, organizing in my neighborhood the past eight years or so where I'll get into that some other day, but um, okay. So what is, so the project you're working on for the second year, I believe is called militant kindergarten. And tell me what that is. So Militant Kindergarten is a 15-week seminar uh, where we do a, a close reading of social anarchism and organization by the Anarchist Federation of Rio de Janeiro. And um, what I mean by close reading is that we read it really slowly, like together. Um, we talk about, we, we ask a lot of questions. We... Um, you know, nitpick about certain words, like what are some different ways to rephrase this? Um, does anyone have any thoughts on like uh, this specific term and this specific usage? Um, we really slow down a lot. And so the, the reading that we do of this is not, um, it's not to try and yeah, like check it off of our list. It's definitely to find new sort of rabbit holes or like uh, gems inside of that to then kind of build uh, other things off of. Okay. Uh, so in the text, again, it's called Social Anarchism and Organization, right? Yeah. Are there other ones? Say that again. Are there other ones? Um, that's the, that's the main text that we read. And then we have some additional resources that we also, uh, have compiled related to that specific text. So it's, um, basically that, that text has become a, like a foundational thing to study among social anarchists internationally. It was originally written in Portuguese and was translated into English in um, maybe 2011. And uh, it's also been translated into Spanish and French. I'm not sure about other translations at the moment, but um, yeah, like it's become really foundational reading because it's a contemporary articulation of this same attempt at uh, organizational dualism. So it's not, um, you know, in contrast to those other things, it just is a different articulation of that. And um, it's, it's especially, you know, uh, a dense text. It's, it's got a lot more theory than, um, you know, than English speakers and than, uh, Amer than like anarchists in the U.S. are, are used to. And that's also where this sort of habit for us to start uh, reading slower and really trying to collaborate with each other. Because it's not just that we maybe haven't been taught the, the methods or the objective behind reading slower, but also we haven't, um, like you said, you know, with your interviews, it's, it's capacity draining. And so right. we we consider this group study the militant kindergarten to be a collaborative effort where we, we know it will be grueling and we mean to like, uh, help support everybody, everybody, um, who wants to complete the kindergarten to be able to. And so let's look at this text a little bit. I think you can see it as well, right? On the, yes. Okay. So, and also I don't, there, is this in print anywhere or is it only PDF? Um, I believe it's only PDF. Uh, last year I printed out my own and like uh, bound it a little bit. And so, uh, yeah, it's all like drawn up and notated all over the place because it really helps with the close reading to have uh, 
a way to take some notes with it. So even if you use a digital copy, I think that's pretty, pretty important at some point. All right. Uh, okay. So I like the cover a lot. Um, but uh, let's go to the table of contents. You already kind of went over some of this. Um, so let's go through this, just, uh, things you would want to point out about the way this book is organized and how you approach, how you approach it. So a good thing to point out in that sense is that right off the bat, we start the kindergarten with part 15. Okay. And part 15 in this is kind of like a, like a summary of all the rest of it. And uh, when I first read that part, um, I kind of thought it was a little like unnecessary and uh, just, um, you know, a uh, rephrasing of, of a sort of history that everyone kind of knows. But as we read it last year in the kindergarten, I really like started to appreciate this chapter. It it really reads well by itself, independent of the rest of the text. It's sort of divided into two parts, where the first part goes through a lot of other kinds of uh, anarchism and what their sort of differences between what they're doing and what a specifismo is, uh, why there would be this difference, what some of these debates mean and uh, how they fit into being influential to their current thought. And then the second part is tracing through um, like historical references. So okay. it goes through um, all sorts of different specific influences to their conception. And that's, that's exactly that thing that like, I think can be lost on, on us just encountering a text is we might just read this as if it's uh, like I would say like a script for for a video essay on YouTube because it just is sort of this broad, uh, you know, reaching uh, history of anarchism. But the fact that it's included in a program from uh, an organization uh, that's written collectively is really significant. And the idea that that organizations would not be able to uh, compile a specific list and short summary of their historical influences as a group is a good example of what I mean by like not having a good enough political level organization. Because even the omission of things shouldn't be this kind of, and that's why the project fell apart. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a bit of a bias, uh, oddly enough, well, for people who know me, towards formalism, where I, I like mission statements and organizational history and uh, all this kind of, uh, I don't know, fluff. Some people might think of it as, but I think it's, I think it's the historical, it's situating yourself into, into the discourse of society in a way. But um. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's exactly like the idea with the specific anarchist organization is that it is the repository of this history of that being articulated. It's the absence of that, which is why like we have to be like kind of figuring out conceptually what that even is, because we don't have a, a specific thing to decide how much do we want to relate to that organization or not. This is right. not something that's that there's a in, in our context, at least like that there's some kind of history tradition of that to have a relationship to. And that's like, you know, if an organization even lasts more than a few years to begin with. Right. Um, what what else? What other sections do you would so, you want to point out? So from there, what we do is we divide the kindergarten into three sections. The first section reads just part 15. So we read okay. the first half and then we read the second half. The second section covers part uh, one through seven. And it does that in three sessions. So we, we speed up a little bit. We read like one, two, three, and then four, five, and six, seven. 
And these chapters, they outline a lot of the theory of um, what they call like here, the, the loss and attempted recovery of the social vector. We can understand this in our context, you know, related to the way that uh, punk rock both like spawns a lot of anarchists, but also teaches us to live in a kind of subculture and not mm -hmm. to get outside of ourselves and to be very used to and accustomed to uniform spaces. And that the social vector has everything to do with those spaces that have more ideologies there. So another way to think of the, the social level is that it has a variety of political forces there. Okay. We should expect other specific organizations in, and again, something that can be helpful here is lowercase o organization. If we could think of that sometimes as like other groups do this, right? Capitalists do this. Like that's what, that's what, uh, you know, a chamber of commerce is, right? right. It's a specific group who meets for political unification, who don't agree on everything and might even be competitors, but have political interests in common. Or the or a think tank or um, think tanks are exactly. big exactly yeah like, like I think that if we recognized how capitalists and the right do not shy away from organizing politically aside from a social level, and that that doesn't mean you know um, we're meaning to copy their ideology or something, but that the social level is filled with lots of ideologies. And if we can't take one there that's collectively supported and refined through, through us debating with ourselves, the people who we do agree with and want to arrive at some unity with, we can't take something that's strong enough to like, you know, stand up next to those things, much less maybe in opposition to them, right? What would, uh... Well, I guess we'll let's move on to part three of how you do this and then talk about uh, some other stuff a little bit. Yeah. So part three is the, the last bit here, part of chapter eight through 14. And all of these cover the specific anarchist organization. And this is, uh, again, like where the most theory is involved. And it's uh, something that is not easy for us to do in English. It really requires a lot of um, uh, engaging with, with theory that is, is you know, um, not uh, analytical. It's, it's um, theory that is uh, not just defining, prescribing what this specific anarchist organization is, but defining what it needs to be able to do, how it needs to be able to conceive of different activities and through like distinguishing it from that social level and that social vector, but still trying to maintain contact with it, what it has to become. And so in our kindergarten, we read these, uh, we slope back down a lot and we just cover one chapter at a time. And uh, some of these are pretty short, like they're only like a page or two, like um, maybe like part 10 or. Um, yeah, this is like five, three pages. Yeah, part 12 is very short. And um, <clears throat> but but, you know, like kind of on this topic of the ideology, an important thing that that this text has taught me is to to own an ideology. That, that there's this kind of slippery, coy way that we've learned to be in, in the politics or like the radical engagement where you just say that's cringe and then don't deal with it. Yeah. Uh, or uh, what I've heard get called out a few times is that anarchists will sort of hop around between insurrectionary communist and post-left and individualist uh, stances you know, given the situation or the question that they're trying to answer. And this is a very, like, slippery, uh, you know, incoherent and uh, kind of intellectually dishonest way of engaging. So if I was to kind of characterize this also, like, we could see two trends that, that happen where uh, 
we what what I've seen termed in the in the text, and this a lot comes from part 15, and we talked about in that first session of the kindergarten last week, is that the the uh, there's a kind of sectarian anarchism. And sectarian anarchism is anarchism that's stuck on the political level, that wants to keep refining its vision of what's going on. And like um, that could be a kind of um, um, anarchism that emphasizes uh, horizontalism in all spaces, uh, refuses to interact with people of different ideologies and has a very strict code for how uh, those interactions uh, work or how the, the group should um, uh, not necessarily comport themselves, but like what the values need to be. And that that affects every space they're willing to engage in. And that keeps them kind of sectored right. off. And I think mm -hmm. that that is a lot more what we see with Marxist tendencies, right? That, that might even sometimes be openly sectarian. Uh, well, Marxists are even weirder because they they will split off from each other, not based on practice, but based on uh, on interpretations of Marx, which, I mean, you know, at least the anarchists are like, okay, well, uh, we're going to do stuff a different way. But. Yeah, it's, it's so like, like, there's this kind of sectarian anarchism, but then there's also this sort of uh, bourgeois anarchism that thinks that any kind of articulation of ideology is is uh, authoritarian. So like a Sternarian anti-ideological or maybe like, some, you know, Wolfie Landstriker kind right. of, well, it yeah. Could, exactly, because it could also be very based in a sort of humanitarian anarchism that thinks that it needs to be spontaneously developed from the people and anyone kind of having a meeting about like the political level is pretending to be vanguardist or like inherently taking a kind of authoritarian position or paternalistic position. Let's let's talk a little bit about that debate because I used to very much be on the side against ideology or on this uh, post the left critique, uh, you know, where you get a lot of. Uh, where ideology functions as a uh, basically a handle for recuperation, I guess you could say it makes it makes uh, anarchism legible to the state or to to the market as something that could be commodified and then turned into a doppelganger of itself, and, or and in this way, it's kind of a, a normative and authoritarian thing. Uh, that's not where I am these days, but I'm still curious what the, you know, from this perspective, if you could entertain it strictly, what the response would be. So re related to that critique, the, the response has to do with um, even, you know, uh, from a, from someone who's like got a very strict individual uh, conception of, themselves or their own freedom, that uh, as soon as that needs to start cooperating with other people in order to accomplish stuff, the, the goal cannot simply be to like uh, um, do whatever the group wants to do. Like you do have personal interests and in that like uh, other people do as well. And that a kind of practical commonality requires um, uh, practical uniformity. The, the, mm -hmm. the idea that, that, again, we would somehow be able to overcome the capitalist forces and their level of organization by doing what spontaneously arises during a mobilization. Another way to think about this, and like, uh, you know, uh, before I started um, learning about Especifismo and studying this text in particular was where um, I was when I was really interested in Sartre's uh, uh, search for a method. And this idea of just just the way that the, the term activism was used in that text was not in this kind of common colloquial way it's used uh, for us. And that activism in the kind of sense of like uh, being 
active all the time. Right. And the like, way that we talk about it is it's guerrilla marketing is right. what we mean by activism in the United States. Yeah, almost like a, a kind of propaganda or something. But yeah, that that uh, this idea of like being being active and having a whole kind of ideology around being active, and the way that um, that creates lulls, and those lulls are when capital and those the forces of the state are able to figure out how to address those uprisings, how to address those threatening revolutionary movements and it is militancy that begins to out like uh, again like we talked about earlier the political level having a, its own cycle its own kind of independent pace and rhythm that doesn't need to be immediately affected by what's going on in the social level so that it can it can participate in it but it is not uh out, it's not a, a drained of capacity as soon as the uh, mobilization is over, because it's then that the most militant work needs to be happening in this kind of like uh, connecting the most uh, uh, revolutionary moments together. Um, when you were talking about the need to, I forget how you phrased it. It was only a moment ago, but just um, about how that spontaneous sort of orientation can lead to a lot of, uh, I'm not going to be able to repeat it, but what this reminded me of was basically how I got into that critique was the way that I used to approach the internet and particularly my, um, my desire to, to, interact online in unmoderated or spaces that allowed for uh, anonymity. But then as I became more and more of a system administrator or message board forum admin or whatever you want to call it, I saw the other side of what that anti-organizational and um, anti-formal and anti uh ideological sort of approach leads to which is 4chan and basically uh it's not the tyranny of structuralist structurelessness problem as much as it is the the problem of the biggest idiot in the room gets the most attention <laughs> So it's not like the domination of like the most uh, well articulated. It's it's almost the opposite of that. Yeah, and um, yeah. You know that that uh, kind of um, it it makes me think about how there's there's a certain efficiency to um, allowing everything, but it is at the detriment to uh, certain certain kinds of unity which uh, don't need to be idealistic unity. They can be ideological without being idealistic. And I think that that's also something that's uh, really important here is that uh, through, through studying a specifismo, I've learned a lot more the way that, and Berthier talks about this as well, that like uh, theory and ideology are conceived of differently in the anarchist tradition than in the Marxist tradition. And in the, in the anarchist tradition, ideology is this thing that we hold like resolutely that we don't uh, question just because like we're in some space where someone brought up a hot take or something. And right. That like that that set of values is something that we mean to figure out how to articulate in the world, but it is not the same as the actual final like objective that we're we're going to, and that that's different than theory, which is essentially a toolbox, and we mean to use theory that's relevant to our situation, that's relevant to our projects, that's relevant to like what reality is actually like. And we can only do that, it, not just in good faith, but in a way that's like, you know, true to our ideology and our values 
if we have those ideolo that ideology and those values clearly articulated and we have other people helping us defend them because then it makes it a lot uh, safer and it, it helps inform our ideology, our practice of the real world because we can interact with other people. I also think that that difference between the way anarchists and Marxists think about ideology is kind of built into uh, just the nature of it in a way, because anarchists tend to see themselves as active participants in the production of their own ideology. Marxists sometimes, some of them, see the proletariat as receiving an ideology from a ruling class and uh, or uh, arriving at interests through their dialectical participation in the class struggle. But they don't, I don't come across a lot of Marxists that see um, the broad collection of Marxists participating together in the production of their own ideology. And I think that's uh, something a little more unique to anarchists. And, you know, specifically in, as it relates to anarchism in North America, that's something that I've encountered with the Especifismo is that uh, we, we're not used to uh, discussing theory, but we're also not used to conceiving a strategy. And so wow. when, when there are strategic uh, discussions that attempt to happen, everything is interpreted as an ideological dispute. And that a lot of times it's not actually on the ideological like uh, plane that this is like uh, disputed. It, that's not really where the division is. And I think that um, it's becoming easier to articulate that to other anarchists. That's something I saw in your discussion with uh, Doug Lane is that I think that to a certain extent, anarchists and anarchism is, is able to respond to this current uh, situation just right now in, in uh, ways that, that I think are relevant in a, in a way that like um, I see Marxism online as being really flat right now and kind of not knowing what to do. And that as, as anarchists continue to sort of discover the political level, we can decide what relationship to have to that. But I think up to now, our anarchism in North America is coming so much out of nowhere that uh, we don't, we're, our politics really is developing out of our, our reality, out of our situation. It's not something we have already defined and we're trying to put it there. And I think that's exactly what Marxists are trying to do in, in the U.S. Yeah, well, there, yeah, there's some, you know, Marxists have a bunch of academics as well that are anarchists have not had. And, you know, our historians in English, like George Woodcock and um, uh, uh, I forget his name, um, some of the 50s era guys, you know, they didn't get everything right. There was a lot they left uncovered and a lot of anarchism in the past since the 90s has really been challenging the received wisdom that we got from those, the former generation about what our, what anarchist history is and where it comes from and stuff like that. So it's still very fresh and new in that way too. I think you can see the way that, that this organizational dualism could really play a significant role in the development of radical politics in the U.S., not only anarchism, but revolutionary politics more generally, because a lot of times like debates amongst these different tendencies on the left here uh, happen in these like either social spaces or these kind of middle spaces. And that if all of the political uh, like uh, tendencies within that space organized on a political level also, they might know how to go to that more social space with a program that lets them know whether that's the space for them to be in or not from the beginning. And it wouldn't be a kind of uh, let's have our political debates in front of everyone all the time. 
because that mm -hmm. ends up making our social movements entirely stopped by that. And that uh, on the other side of that, there's this kind of, you know, like, oh, if we just come out when there's social movements and then like go back away, eventually the wave will get big enough, it'll topple stuff. But that like that kind of just completely checking out and turning off is also part of the problem. We need something more militant that is driven through these kinds of peace times, through these times of respite. Yep, I agree. Uh, how So different angle here. How popular would you say a specifismo is getting and uh, region be a little bit region specific, I guess, in your answer to that? I mean, obviously, that's that's somewhat difficult to describe. It's certainly, uh, uh, you know, a um, minority within uh, social anarchists and, uh, you know, anarchists already a minority within the left. So as far as a kind of raw numbers, I don't think that it's some kind of, you know, impressive amount of people. At the same time, the idea behind a specifismo is exactly that like you don't need to be turning everyone in a social movement to anarchism that that would be impossible and that anyone attempting to take that kind of ideological unity to a social project to a so to a popular organization is is going to fail not just in their efforts but they're going to sabotage the movement itself and uh so yeah. like, how do we both have this like really refined position that we, we take and hold while we're there and we prioritize that space as what it is? Meaning like really respecting what the demands of a specific space are versus the demands of another specific space. Okay. Um, and then I guess the last question I have is, I don't know if this is in the text anywhere or if you've thought about this a whole lot, but it's been a big concern for me lately is, uh, how does money play into anarchist organizing? And what I mean by that is dues collecting and having a treasury as part of your organization, not you specifically, but um, it seems to me that one of the big things that a lot of uh, organizations with staying power do is they collect money somehow, whether it's a union, a church, uh, uh, academic, you know, NGO, whatever it is. Um, but yet anarchists you know, tend to be not very wealthy. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a stigma around having money so there's going to be a bit of a uh, you know people not wanting to out themselves as having money to fund a project or things like that and i'm wondering if that gets addressed in any of the stuff that you're reading with this so i think that that um the question is not entirely irrelevant, but uh, if we thought about money, maybe the same way that as specifists address um, uh, violence, where um, violence is not uh, what anybody is aiming to do. That's not the goal of the movement. Um, uh, having specific uh, violent acts is not some uh, way of catalyzing something that, that would be produced to make social transformation. Social transformation comes from organization. And that because of that, that kind of um, uh, at, like attempting to... Um, Take, take a thing like that off the table altogether is not the idea. But if the social movement itself needs that, that tactic, then that's something that would be employed, which means like in a way like the, the anarchist organization, the specific anarchist organization doesn't need to be able to uh, raise funds for its own project because its project is to unify politically and to reinsert those ideas socially. 
and that that money or fundraising would only matter in a sense that it already matters on a social level. Right. Meaning it's already part of a kind of um, immediate effort to be doing something like that. And that I would say in a, in a really immediate sense in, in our context, this goes back to what I mean about that lowercase o organization and that we need to not read this uh, organizational dualism as dual organizationalism, because that can force us into this kind of constructivist way of thinking of prefiguring the organization that will already need to exist for a long time, that needs to be able to take in money and like produce these different things. And that uh, a lot more the way that we have approached uh, this kind of organizing and this sort of theory in our context is moving as quickly as that unity permits to understand that like we don't have we can't just jump to some political level because we don't have a reference for doing that and that we need to be able to crawl there in in a certain sense and that the same way that these other um you know like we talked about earlier affinity groups um or identity uh, groups could be stations where people kind of get stuck. And that includes like uh, punk scenes or uh, cyclist organizations or uh, gardeners or whatever those things might be where people get, they, they are doing this thing and it's not about that thing being good or bad, but it's like, if that thing can't connect to a larger movement, then it is just isolated. And so there needs to also be a station where those people can go to talk about how to how to unify that. Not because everyone that, that's at that garden wants to go unify with other people, but because some people might, right? It doesn't mean that that most militant level is going to have the most numbers. It means very much the opposite. It is a, a small minority that's active and that that's the point. It's the most active people that at least they're on board and that like in our specific context, that also includes like they talk about in this text, not becoming sleeves for people who volunteer the org to do certain tasks and then don't show up when it's time to do them. So that if the most organized people are the ones that are most militant about the ideas, they can also make decisions collectively for themselves and not be used by sort of this like a, uh, people who show up to make decisions or this like uh, kind right. of people who have a lot of vested interest in the philosophy behind it and actually aren't going to do any of the work. Like, uh, yeah, like an anti-war movement or... or. Or just like the, a lot of people will show up to the first meeting and, you know, by the 10th meeting, not a lot of people are showing up. And if the people who showed up by the 10th meeting were actually the ones just deciding for themselves from the beginning the whole thing would itself be more like self-managed, right? That like the, the most militant people should be managing their militancy themselves. And that, that kind of goes without saying, but it also just isn't a common practice because a lot of times the most militant people are trying to acquiesce to the like, kind of like people sitting on the fence. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that this, like, distinctly, this is not about alienating those people sitting on the fence, but it's about creating another side of the fence so people can decide if they want to cross to it or not. Like, uh, that, that's an important thing about militancy is it's not some sort of status or thing that you get forever. And I think that that would also go for this sort of like way that fundraising works is like that that's really specific to like each kind of place where the, where a specific org is beginning to articulate itself and that like a po politically like on the political level the more specific that org is able to articulate itself locally the more it does connect to these ideas that are international and so the political level becomes something that's especially unified that's where things like uh, anarchismo.net function in a certain way to uh, foster that current and like we talked about before where like um, the sort of rapprochement of of platformism and especificismo I think is more of a, something happening in the 21st century that is not misplaced but is it's us it's it's contemporary 
And maybe we have a tendency to sort of be like, oh, I thought we were learning about like the famous people from history or something. Or, but it's it's a lot more current than I think some of us in the U.S. realize. And in studying this text, we're doing current theory of anarchism, right? Like it's it's not just there already done for us. Well, I think you have made the case that it's a vibrant and uh, living uh, uh, area of anarchist work. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about this? We're all, we've been recording about an hour now. So, um, you know, just one thing I would, I would add in here is kind of, uh, the, the meanings behind our, our militant kindergarten, because, um, you know, at the first level, like it's kind of just something that's funny, right? It's ironic, um, that obviously like, uh, it's kindergarten and that's children and uh, militant and those things uh, maybe seem like a, a trolling from the, the right or something. Right. But uh, it's also, uh, yeah, if you think about it for even just a little bit, that's not, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you, if you kind of uh, think of some of the other meanings of this, where what we, what we thought of is that part of why there's not a political level is there's not a way to return to this kind of study that a lot of times when we on a personal level studied something or even on a local level uh, studied a text in a reading group, we tend not to produce any secondary sources of that thing. So we're not really making a reading that anyone else in our movement is able to use and benefit from. An important part of Militant Kindergarten is all of these resources are available on our website and anyone else can produce their own seminar with these same materials. Uh, it's not something that, you know, is trademarked or something, right? It's like uh, a militant kindergarten is a kind of close reading other people could, could, uh, yeah, like uh, organize on their own. And so then the, the like last idea of this is, is also that um, we, mean to return back there like uh, kindergarten, like go back to the basics and not close that path off. But like, that's kind of not something people think about with kindergarten either, right? Like that's like a thing you did one time, but like kindergarten teachers go back there every year and they go back there and they learn more about kindergarten. And to us, that's what political education is, is like, we're not just closing the door because we personally read a text one time. So we think of this text as a kind of like station out in the woods that, you know, the expedition to get there is really hard and grueling and we can't do it for other people. And we can't just bring that station closer to them. So it's hard. It's grueling on them. But we're willing to make this expedition an annual thing that like we will, you know, guide and help anyone who wants to, uh, accomplish that and to kind of, yeah, like be deep inside of this study. And that through that, we hope to like help other people learn to produce more secondary sources of, of texts like this. I think that relates a lot to what we've talked about before with Bakunin and what you talked about with Berthier. And a big part of what, what he does is producing the, the sources of the source because the the actual you know uh synthesizing that larger thing is maybe not the that's not a nothing task and we need to start respecting that kind of militancy of of uh, education it's an important part of establishing that political level uh all right well i agree with that um well thank you for coming on the show again i'm I'm happy we got to talk about this. I will make sure that I provide all the relevant links in the uh, show description. And uh, yeah, uh, you're probably going to be one of the few interviews I do this year. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now. <laughs>